And this is work done with his co-authors, Miran Magumi, Corey Pittman, and Joe Laviola on a rapid prototyping approach to synthetic data generation for improved 2D gesture recognition. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. The only thing I might add on top of that is that the three of us are under the advisement of Dr. Joseph Laviola. So let's get right into it. Over the last few days, I've, I've come to appreciate that people think of gestures in very different ways. So in this presentation, we're thinking basically of drawings that are symbols or characters and drawn with a stylus on an interactive display or a touch device using your finger or your wrist on a smartwatch. Um, and we're concerned primarily with trying to improve recognition accuracy. As it stands now with a lot of machine learning problems, the more data that you have to train the recognizer with, the better shape you're in. So more samples is generally good news for a recognizer, but it's bad news for people because it's a burden to ask a user to provide a lot of new samples for a custom gesture class they want to use in the software. And it's a burden on you and I as researchers or um, practitioners that every time we want to iterate on a user interface, we have to provide a bunch of new samples for different ideas we're exploring. Basically, cu gesture customization again. And it would be really handy if when I add a new feature to a user interface and provide a couple of samples, and I pass it off to a collaborator who also adds some new functionality and some new samples, that it just works for both of us. It recognizes both of our handwritings, and when we ask somebody else in the lab to try it out, it works for them as well. So what we're focusing in on here is trying to do a little bit more with a little bit less. So if we can just provide one training sample or two training samples per gesture class, then we'd be in good shape. Obviously, one way to do that is just invent a better gesture recognizer. And it's a little bit easier said than done, of course, but it's a valid approach, and people are working towards that. But an alternative solution, of course, is to use synthetic data, where given real samples, we make intelligent modifications of those samples to create a reasonable variation. And if we do that repeatedly over and over again, we can create a distribution that we can use to train a recognizer. And that's what we're focused in on this work. But also, we want to streamline that process as much as possible, make it as simple to implement, so that way it fits within the rapid prototyping paradigm, which I'll describe in a moment. So since synthetic data is not new, the first part of this presentation, I want to take you through a couple of different approaches, three of them, not exhaustive of what exists out there, but I think a good representation of what's possible. Discuss some of the issues that exist with those methods, and then I'll be in a position where I can introduce our new method, gesture pass stochastic resampling, the method, and spend some time on the one parameter that needs to be tuned to get the most out of our method. Once we have those things in place, we can take a look at how they improve recognition accuracy. So one thing that may have come to mind already is if you want to create a synthetic variation, one easy thing you can do is a geometric transformation of the data not at a global scale because most recognizers are scale and rotation invariant, but if you do it on parts of gestures, which is what gesture script does as an example, then you can get some pretty good variation. Now the software, it's like a laboratory type software where you can work with gestures and create recognizers using scripts. But what I want to draw your attention to is in the lower right corner, sorry it's a little blurry on these displays, but you can see synthetic samples that are being generated. And since it's an interactive software, you can select samples that are useful and discard samples that don't make much sense or are completely degenerate. Um, one problem with this approach, however, is that we need something that's completely automatic for use in our software. And we need to ensure that the samples that are being generated are not degenerate. So that way, if we just um, blindly trust they're OK and train a recognizer with them, we're still going to get good results. A second approach that's common is to use noise models. So this is an example of one approach using Perlin noise, where we create random vector field, th throw the gesture into it, and let it warp according to where it lies. I wouldn't say the samples are very realistic looking, but there's variability there. And it'd be, it's good for um, parametric rec recognizers, for example. This, this technique was used, for instance, to train a mathematics handwriting recognizer to better recognize symbols. Some issues with this approach is that it can be a little bit slow to generate the fields, and it's not immediately obvious how you create a reasonable noise pattern that's going to make a difference. And there's also usually a lot of tunable parameters that have to be set to get the most out of the method. We want to try to avoid as much of that as possible. One of my personal favorites 
is uh, using domain knowledge here. These, these equations model the complex neuromuscular interactions that occur due to rapid movement, which you have uh, your arms or rapid movement, your head, eyes, or handwriting as well. So the visualization is a little more helpful. The way it works is that a gesture can be described as a velocity profile. And that velocity profile can be decomposed into a set of log normal functions, where each function has its own start and end angle, and each function is, uh, defines a part of the velocity within that trajectory. So if you have a model in hand, you can perturb the parameters and create synthetic variations. Some examples are shown at the bottom. The difficulty with this approach, however, is parameter extraction can be a little bit complex. And uh, you know, it's, it's an iterative process involving estimation, optimization steps. And if the data, input data, is noisy, it can be especially difficult to get good models. Or if the timing information is not reliable, like if it was collected on a low resolution device, then the models you get out of it are going to be poor quality. I would say in general, one of the issues that still exists is that none of these approaches are really appropriate for rapid prototyping. And why that's important is that um, rapid prototyping recognizers, such as the Dollar family, have become um, especially popular, which means that if you want to incorporate gesture recognition within your user prototype, user interface prototype, it's really easy just to do it from scratch, and often easier than integrating a library or even learning the API for a library that you would like to use. So a lot of people are just implementing gesture recognition from scratch. And what we want to provide to them is a method that they can leverage the power of synthetic data generation as well. Now, I don't think there's a clear criteria for what defines rapid prototyping appropriate, but the general idea is that it's very accessible. So some implications of that might be that um, you can understand the method very easily, very quickly. The data manipulation routines are very straightforward. And these two together mean you can implement it very quickly, which is what I think our me method accomplishes that other methods do not. We have a very simple two-step approach to be able to generate synthetic data. So you start off with a sample, which in this case is an infinity symbol. Step one, stochastically resample the gesture path. You can do that, for instance, by drawing numbers from a random distribution, concatenating those together, normalizing. Then you have points between 0 and 1 along which the gesture path you can take samples. Step 2, normalize the distance between. And that has the effect of shortening or lengthening the gesture path. And it's kind of as if we've modified the action plan used by a writer to create that gesture, which means that we're changing the timing information along the trajectory, which is a little bit similar to the sigma log normal model we looked at earlier with the, with the um, kinematic theory. And that's the basic idea of this method. You can optionally smooth it if you want to. You would only need to do that if you're rendering. Completely unnecessary to train the recognizer. But with those two steps, that's all you need. And then you just rinse and repeat, and you can create a distribution very quickly. It's about six to eight microseconds on the Surface Pro. And create a whole distribution in less than a millisecond. You train your recognizer, you're in pretty good shape. And I think it's worth taking a moment to appreciate the fact that you probably know enough now you can implement this without a reference. The only thing we need to discuss now is how to select the resampling rate. And it's going to vary per gesture. Here's an example of a right curly brace, resampled to n equals 16 points. It's not pretty, but almost every single sample is recognizable as a right curly brace. If we smoothed it, it would look nice as well. And if this creates a lot of variability, and it would be good to train a gesture recognizer with. But if we bump this up to n equals 64, then that variability is constrained. And I would say it's a little bit too strict. It's a lot prettier to look at because we're using 64 points instead of 16. But we're not going to get the same level of recognition accuracy. On the other hand, if we look at the triangle chain, and we resample to n equals 16 points, we get very terrible results, a lot of degenerate cases. And if we were to train a recognizer with this particular distribution, we would run the risk of degrading performance as some of these samples may cross into the territory of other, of other samples. It really depends on the vocabulary. So now we go back up to n equals 64. We have a fairly nice distribution. All of the samples recognizable. Um, unlike the right curly brace, it's not too strict. These are, we have a lot of variability in there. And like I already said, they're all recognizable. So this would be very good to train with. What this means is 
what we want to try to do is find a function of a given sample that will give us a reasonable value of n we can use to create a synthetic distribution. Our strategy for finding that function follows. For a given gesture, we take all the samples that we would use um, and find the centroid. Using that centroid, we find the dissimilarity to every other gesture in the data set, sorry, every other sample of that gesture in the data set, and take that average of the dissimilarity. That gives us a way to characterize the distribution. Then take that centroid, create a bunch of synthetic distributions, each with a different level of n, and find the distribution that most closely resembles the real distribution. Then, with that gesture and other gestures from other data sets, extract features and try to regress those features on the best end to find our function. What features should we use? We tried a lot of them, and we tried to find ones that fit within the rapid prototyping paradigm. And there was two that stood out. One was closedness. That's how close is the first and last point in a gesture with respect to the size of the gesture. Generally, the more closed the gesture is, the higher value of n we needed. Another good feature was density, which is the path length divided by the size of the gesture. So more complex gestures, a little bit more dense, and again, the higher level of n we needed to recreate the distribution. Putting these together, we get a very simple parsimonious equation that gives us a reasonable value of n to use for any particular sample. But I prefer visualization, so here's the real distribution of the stars from the $1 gesture data set. The red in the center is the centroid, and the distance from the centroid is the measure of dissimilarity. If we want to create a synthetic distribution, we'll draw that in blue using n equals 20. We can see here this is a pretty poor result. Um, the synthetic samples are really far away from the center, so we need to try to ring that in as much as possible. Now, if we reuse our optimal n equation, we can see we get a much closer result. It's not perfect, but it follows the real distribution much more closely. And the fringe elements that you see, they're still mostly recognizable as stars, and if you train a recognizer with them, you still know and you get pretty good results. So now, now we can evaluate it. How well does it actually work? And the protocol we use is similar to what I described at the start, where we have different users or researchers that are contributing to a particular project, and they all want the recognizer to work well amongst themselves. So we use the mixed writer protocol, where we pool all samples together from all participants and randomly select a training set, a test set, train the recognizer, throw the test set at it, get an average error, repeat that a thousand times for a point of interest, and get a grand average error. Some points of interest, different recognizers on different data sets, where we vary the number of real training samples provided from one to five. And if we're using th synthetic data, for each real sample that's given, we generate 64 synthetic samples. We tested mostly on rapid prototyping recognizers, mostly do dollar family to be specific. And we tested on four publicly available data sets. Three of them were unistroke, one was a multi-stroke. And we mostly get results, they all look like this. The y-axis is the error rate, obviously the lower the better. The x-axis is the real sample count, so the number of real samples provided as part of the test. And then the top line is our baseline recognition error rate. That's the recognizer trained with only real data. The other three are rec the same recognizer trained with synthetic data. The two in the middle are the Perlin noise we talked about and the sigma log normal model that we talked about. They're uh, overlapping each other because they're very similar in performance. But our method is the bottom line, gesture past stochastic resampling. In most of our tests, most recognizers, most data sets, this is what the curves look like, where our approach gets the best error rate, and some exact numbers for that. We were able to reduce the error rate using the $1 recognizer on the $1 data set for the mixed writer mode by 14% with Perlin noise, 17% with the log normal model, and almost double that with our approach using stochastic resampling. Another example, Penny Pincher on the $1 gesture data set is uh, Perlin noise reduced the error rate by 42%, sigma log normal 61%, and stochastic resampling, almost 80%. Again, most of what we tested was in this range between 30 to 80% um, reduction in error rate using our approach. And that brings us close to the end. So to reiterate, we have, we have, uh, we introduced a new method, gesture past stochastic resampling, 
that is a two simple two-step process to generate synthetic data to better improve recognizers. And we focused a lot on rapid prototyping, but you can see it's competitive with other state-of-the-art techniques, which means that it probably can be used with a lot of other gesture recognizers as well. And that's part of what we're going to explore in the future. There's a lot of things that we didn't have time to go into. So I encourage you to see the paper if this interests you, like how do we extend this to multi-stroke samples, some more detailed analysis on optimal and um, as well as recognition accuracy, pseudocode, and of course limitations. So I think that's it on time, because you said one minute earlier. And Great work. This on. Uh, Jacob Obrock from the University of Washington. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, I really like it. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, quick question. I, I might have missed it. Do you, uh, I don't uh, remember seeing the result for how many gestures of, of each type from the human gave optimal outcomes. So, and I'm wondering in particular, so is this the one, is this the, our x axis here? So the x-axis is the number of real samples per gesture right. class okay. that we're given. So I'm, I can do pretty well if I just give two and then I'm done. Yeah. Two of each type. So that's not very much work. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. OK, thanks. Is that, is, I answered your question then? <laughs> yeah, I think I, okay. yeah, I just, because it seems like the, this is for each human sample, you're getting 64 synthetics, right? Yes, that's right. So, but. Um, do those interact? Are those two factors interacting? So if I gave, if I gave three, could I have less than 64? If I gave five, could I have, you know, 20, 23? Do, did you look at that issue at all? No, I didn't look at it, but I suspect the answer would be yes. The more real samples you have, likely the less synthetic samples you would have that generate the same level of accuracy. Um, not something I looked at specifically, but that would be anticipated. Other questions? Following, up, following on to Jake's question, I, I have a question, which is if you change the number of synthetic samples drastically, so instead of giving 64 synthetic samples, if you gave 1,000 synthetic samples, would, would you see any large changes in the, the accuracy of your system? Yeah, um, so far it goes up quite a bit for each level of synthetic samples that you increase by. I don't know what the limit is. I didn't try to take it very far out past 64. I think 128 was the max I went to, and there was still an increase in performance. But the main issue that we want to address here is it's unnecessary to generate 1,000 samples. What we need to do instead is more intelligently select which samples we keep as part of training. Because when we're generating these distributions, there's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot that are, say, very near the centroid sample you used to create the distribution with. So if we could instead select some of the more uh, further apart gestures that are within that distribution, we could train with just four or eight samples and get really high accuracy instead of using 64 or 1,000. We have time for one more question. Um, great work, thanks. Thank so I was just wondering what type of inputs does this apply to? I know, I know you looked at $1, but did you look at other type of stroke-based recognition so, algorithms, so text, handwritten text? I believe it should work well with any time series data. Um, so you're talking about like, like 3D gestures as well, right? Yeah, so I've had some success as well using accelerometer data and connect data and other um, 3D inputs. The main issues that you start to run into, though, is that if there's uh, complete independence between different things, like in connect, you have two different arms that are moving, then we need a way to be able to separate that and synthesize those parts independently, which is part of what we're working on. So yes, we've tried it with a lot of other data, and we've seen success in other areas as well. Thanks. Let's thank uh, our speaker. And before you go.